main area of our research is the search has to do something with proper names. Proper names, in fact, philosophical term, not a linguistic term, but generally names of persons, name, names of organization, and other entities. And in this part of the work, we our main interest was names of the persons, but we plan to extend this to the names of other entities. Uh, so it may seem, uh, especially if you didn't tackle this problem, as some easy task, even as trivial task. At least it thought so when we start trying to do this analysis of proper names. What we wanted to do, we wanted to like something what an historian would do in researching his subject, and to model his research to make computational models of uh, parsing, understanding, and inferring information from the personal names. So, uh, I plan this, just a sec, sorry, okay, my, I suppose it's two tiny fonts, can you see what you don't know? Okay, <laughs> okay. Right. so uh, I'd like to start with uh, our vision, with a big picture, this is what we wanted to do, we wanted to perform, and how we came, in fact, to this problem of trying to understand and make computational models for understanding proper names. Uh, then I'll share with you some of the characteristics of these historical sources of this text that we use uh, and that we want to, uh, in, in, in some way, understand and infer uh, in our project. Uh, then I will share at least some information about our problem, at least as we understand it. this problem. After this, uh, I would like to present this state-of-the-art solution for the, this problem. As I'm sure that many of these are familiar with this solution. This is conditional random fields, natural language processing, machine learning. Uh, please rush me through materials if it's familiar to you. It is overboring to repeat some of this uh, background information. Uh, then I present something what used to be state-of-the-art at least 20 years ago. This is this rule-based approach to understand and to parse proper names in similar text. And finally, I will turn to the, our original research to something that has to do with this inferring we call the standard name form. In fact, this is parsing and understanding personal names. And finally, if there is time left, uh, I would like to share with you some lessons learned and some direction of future research that uh, I believe may be interesting to you. Also, I have a tendency to mumble some, some, uh, sometimes, so please, <laughs> if I ask for something, I have no problem to be interrupted. Stop me and we will return to the issue, no problem at all. Uh, okay, so what is our vision? What is our big picture? So as uh, Professor Vitek is historian and I'm a logician. We wanted to do, to do something with logic and history on some high level. We wanted to build some historical reasoning system to use uh, advanced methods from philosophical logic to do counterfactual reasoning, simulation of historical processes, so, and so on. So we have this maybe two ambitious uh, aim to do. And the first problem we occurred, of course, is that there is no enough structured information about history. So we wanted to do some system that will transform this typical source in history, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And this is some, some structured representation of this uh, source. Uh, this particular one will be RDF or semantic frame representation, but in fact we would be happy with any structured representation of uh, historical data. Maybe it allow me just a bit of digression about this distinction between structured and unstructured data. And I suppose most of you are familiar with this uh, distinction. And, uh, but uh, this is at least philosophically looking not very clear distinction. As many other uh, concepts and distinction in humanity, especially in computer science, this uh, distinction between uh, what is structured data, what is not, not structured data, in my opinion, depends on the context and the purpose of use. So structured data has to do something with ambiguity and introducing ambiguity in the text. So, and it depends on the context on context what is ambiguity and what is not. So for example, standardly in the text analysis there will be 
lexical ambiguity and structural ambiguity. But in our context, one very important ambiguity has to do with semantic ambiguity. For example, if you have a word father in some historical text, this can be looking from a logical perspective binary predicates or relation among two persons. But it can also be property. This is a predicate with one argument. This is property of someone being father in the sense of being priest or being. So this is kind of semantic ambiguity. Also another important semantic ambiguity has to do with entity resolution and for it to identify persons behind the names. But the names can be similar. And as you know, there are a huge amount of semantical ambiguity in many historical texts. So this is uh, what we want to do. We wanted to get uh, to the structure, take, to take the structure as possible, to do some high-level reasoning with logic and other computational system. So semantic web is something that is closest to this idea to have information that is structured enough so that we can reason about them and can reduce some ambiguity so that computer can easily do this. Uh, maybe, maybe one small illustration of what would mean this distinction between structured and unstructured data in our context. For example, imagine that you have a list of the names, of the full names in some database systems. And uh, if you want to count them or just maybe print mailing label or something like this, this you can consider that this information is structured. You can, you can easily do something with this information. Uh, if you want to do something more advanced, maybe like address all this person in the list properly, the person as manner, like, you know, dear Mr. Jones, dear Mr. Smith, and so on, then this list isn't structured. Because you need to apply advanced algorithms to extract this part of name and to make this seemingly structured information really structured for your purpose. So this structure and structure distinction, again, is a matter of purpose, and we in this case, we wanted to have information extraction as possible. Okay, so uh, this is one of the, I, I suppose many of you are familiar with such sources, one of typical historical sources that has to be analyzed. And in this work, we uh, try to concentrate on the one type of the sources. Uh, please correct me in this part. If, um, talking something wrong, because it's not my part, but of my colleagues, <laughs> many of them historians. No, you should, should maybe mention that it's, I think it's 18th century uh, material, it's the 19th, 19th century material. Uh, this, this one is 18th century, out of this case it is 19th century. 19th century, so yeah. just... This is just, fine, just, just illustration of... Time yeah. scale we're talking about. Yeah, 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 census data. Yeah, census data, yeah, this is, uh, this, 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 uh, it's like not census data, this is uh, church book, parish books, but we'll come to... Uh, okay, so uh, what we wanted to solve is this so-called serial sources. Uh, I suppose this is standard term in history. No? This is standard name in history, serial sources. Serial sources. sources. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because this is not my background. <laughs> so uh, what is important from at least my perspective of this source is that there's some systematic educational structure. So in, in a way you can look at these uh, serial sources as some predecessors of modern databases. Unfortunately, they are not structured enough to be automatically used, <laughs> but at least there, there is more structure in this than the other narrative historical sources that also interest analysis, but much harder to perform and to do. Uh, okay, so uh, what we wanted to do is, of course, extract as much uh, as possible uh, and this ambiguity, uh, reduce this ambiguity in these sources and extract as much as possible information. And, uh, when we start to try to build computational model of this, we first analyze what a historian, what a real people researcher are doing to do this. So it was uh, unfortunately a very traumatic experience because uh, it's a very, very hard uh, task to perform. It's, it's more than decrypting something that reading source. And so it was, it takes in some cases, a lifetime of one long researcher to finish analysis of such uh, such one source. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the same case here, but in Croatia, the most of such sources are still not analyzed, and there are, there are still only the scans or images of the historical sources. You, you can use computational models to build, to extract interesting information from them. Okay, so. Uh, 
And also it's case in our country, I'm not sure it's case, it's true in other countries that use of computers in history is very limited. In fact, it's mostly for some statistical uh, methods, statistical reasons. It's not very advanced use. Even when people use computers, for example, when they translate or extract such sources, they use some low tech solution like Excel or some other inappropriate uh, technical solution, so they just can't use this properly. This is a pity, in fact, that people are losing so <laughs> much time in uh, using uh, wrong tools. Okay, so uh, in our particular case of Croatia, uh, according to my colleague Dr. Wittek, there is two main uh, stage uh, in availability of these historical sources. And one is uh, in the middle age, and the main uh, main characteristic of these uh, sources in middle age, first there are very few of them, and uh, most of them are in Latin language. So uh, because in kingdom of middle age, kingdom of Croatia, Latin is like an official language. This is one of this concrete illustration is one of the exception to this rule, which is so-called Basca Table. This is one of the first Tavolic inscript uh, in Croatia in old Church Slavonic language, but most of other uh, most of other sources uh, are in Latin language. In the modern age, as uh, Croatia become a part of uh, of uh, not Ottoman Empire but Austro-Hungarian monarchy, uh, there was bigger centralization and uh, introduction of bureaucracy and state administration into our country and this is the time where most of the modern uh, sources that are, are analyzed by historians have been produced. So uh, most of these sources are in German languages, German languages, official language in Croatia from 16th century until maybe 100 years ago. Uh, so most of these sources are uh, in Croatian language, uh, in German language, but unfortunately it's not some kind of standard German language. There are many Slavic names, many Hungarian names, many uh, Ottomans names, so there's some strange mixture, mixture of uh, notation, there is no standard name form. So altogether these sources are pretty messy. Okay, uh, so to return to our test case, it's not very visible but it's a uh, 19th century census. Uh, this is in fact first modern census in, in Croatia and this was done by, by Vienna court and this is something that was in fact one of the most valuable sources of, of historiography in 19th century uh, Croatian history. Uh, there was altogether about 1.2 million people uh, in this census that uh, are in the area of present of the modern Croatia because it's a different uh, than. Uh, it's, and it's more or less uh, modern census in the sense that you, you will find most of the information you expect from modern census also in this source. So it was organized as households, there are names of the persons, there are, there are date of birth, there was uh, religious conviction, occupation, source of income, and, and so on. Uh, okay, so what we try to do with these sources, this is something fairly standard. We want to do some standard natural language processing pipeline to apply this pipeline to get from the digital scans of the sources to the semantic web. This was our ambitious, too ambitiously <laughs> conceived uh, vision. And I suppose most of you are familiar with this standard the natural language pipeline. Should I rush from it or take it slowly? Okay, just maybe I will mention a few things that are particular to our test case. First of all, there is not necessary four steps. I used four steps because in this part, one campaign was four <laughs> steps. It can be from two to six, it depends on the concrete application, but usually, first phase in the case of historical sources will be either scanning and OCR and doing optical character recognition of this historical source or transcript, trans making transcription of these sources manually. So this is the first step and both steps are very problematic. Uh, we got the transcription for this case so we didn't have to 
do this work, but we try just to play with uh, applying various OCR solution to these handwritten documents. And our first impression is that it would take much more time to train uh, OCR models to recognize this uh, handwritten census than to transcribe this. Uh, okay, another problem with this uh, approach is that what you get from this uh, first process is usually this stuff what's called dirty text. It's a very messy text with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, problems, with a lot of errors. You know, usually many, many, many words are recognized in the wrong way. There is extra spaces between the words, within the words. So some kind of uh, dirty text normalization is usually applied to the resource. Uh, the problem of applying standard dirty text normalization is that these historical sources are historical. And many of the words doesn't exist in modern dictionary. Maybe even types of writing capitalization is different. So using standard dirty text normalizer didn't work on our case. So this is an another challenge in this first phase. Uh, standard second phase is tokenization of these documents. So it's, uh, Seemingly trivial uh, identifying tokens or words in the document, uh, but even this uh, simple uh, step of tokenization is so trivial because uh, it counts uh, what you should define as a token. For example, is token a word that has dashes or full stops or some other non uh, non letter signs in this, and this is important because this. Uh, Tokenization influences uh, future steps in natural language pipeline. So it's, it's important to define tokens properly. In our approach, we did very aggressive tokenization. We just tokenized all the letter versus not letters, and this is something that's worked well in our case. Uh, another step that is uh, often uh, performed is some kind of text segmentation, usually of segmentation sentences. In our uh, test case, this wasn't applicable, but we just uh, we just tried to play a bit with this, and unfortunately, again, uh, standard sentence uh, segmentation models didn't perform well on our text because they are trained on the modern text, and again, there is not enough of the instructional information, full stop, and so on, to segment automatically these types of sentences. Uh, Natural next step and a bit more advanced step is the name entity recognition, which is of course familiar to all of you. So name entity recognition is marking name entity in the text and categorizing this name entity as a person's uh, organization, location, temporal expression, and, and so on. Again, uh, we tried some of the state of the art name entity recognizer like Stanford, name entity recognizer, and so on. This is recognizer that perform extremely well on the modern text. They, they are able to, for example, achieve about more than 90% of F score in standard modern text, but in our test case, it performed so badly that we didn't even want to <laughs> formally calculate the performance because it's just uh, it's completely uh, un unusable. Uh, another kinetic step with name entity recognition is uh, something called, as you are familiar probably with, entity resolution. This is sometimes called record linkage or record duplication. And we also, this has to do with not only finding name entity, but identifying the reference of name entity. So the idea is to connect, uh, if you have, for example, what you usually have with historical sources, for example, in Paris books, uh, same person is baptized, then is married, then can be godfather or something, finally is book on disease. You want to uh, identify this person as being the same person. To be, you just, for any interesting analysis like family tree reconstruction or something like that, you have to perform uh, an entity resolution. Uh, and the final step, usually final step, is something called relation extraction. This is finally extract, extracting interesting structural knowledge about source. This has to do uh, with connecting and making relations among name entity. Uh, so this is something, for example, you will extract who is father of who, who is born where, and, and, and so on. Uh, 
something related to relation extraction, but maybe even a step further, is inferring relations. So this is usually standardly done in semantic way. So in standard relation extraction, we take just exact relations that are visible in the text. And often in semantic web, uh, you have ontology that enables you to infer future uh, relationship among them. For example, if uh, two entities uh, share the same mother, uh, you can infer that these two entities are sisters, and so on. This is something that is standardly done in semantic web. Uh, maybe it's uh, worth to mention some alternative to this standard natural language processing pipeline. Uh, this alternative is called joint inference. I'm not sure if you are familiar with this expression joint inference. The idea of joint inference is not to segment all these uh, NLP tasks uh, to perform one by one, but to try to uh, guess, to infer the most probable the most probable interpretation of final product from the all stage together. This is something that uh, can use, for example, semantical information and other information to reduce ambiguity on some lower level, like syntactical or morphological levels. So this joint difference, in fact, at least in my opinion, is something that is very similar to what real uh, human researchers do when they research, uh, when they research historical sources, because uh, it's, I suppose, subconscious and natural to use all these semantical constraints and information to infer about syntactical and morphological constraints. For example, if you see uh, in some place that uh, female name next to the word godfather, then you can conclude on semantical level that this is wrong, and that, there's, should, that this true information should be separated. So this joint inference is something what is our final aim to do, to build systems that will use all this information from all steps to reduce ambiguity on all levels. Uh, there are a few articles uh, that may be very interesting to you about this joint inference. They are doing by Pedro Domingas, if you heard from Pedro Domingas from the University of Washington, who are doing this joint inference in parsing uh, bibliographical citation. So they, they, this is something that I believe there is still a computational problem with this because there are a lot of computational resources are needed to do properly joint inference, but this is something that I believe should be applied to resources like this. Okay, am I rushing through? Okay. Okay, so uh, what is the, this first problem uh, we occurred? And uh, this is in fact seemingly trivial problem of understanding proper names. And we notice that when a researcher doing his or her research in the archive and reading historical sources, uh, infer a bunch of information from the uh, first name, from the structure of the name, and using this information to make inference about some historical facts or some historical relation. So, for example, if you can, if you see same two entities sharing surnames, there is probability that these two entities are related. And there is so much of this uh, probably tactically used in information that are just used by people and computational system really manage to capture this information. So uh, first we thought this is something very easy to do, you know, just if you want to parse, if you want to understand proper name, just use regular expression, you know, first token is first name, last token is uh, last name. In some cases you will have double surname, so generally it shouldn't be uh, so hard. Unfortunately, in, at least in our experience, it's really hard to do, it's hard to do it properly, even in the case of the modern names, and especially in the case of the names that occur in historical sources. So, in trying to implement this big picture of transforming uh, historical sources to semantic web, this is one of the first problem we occurred, and we spent at least two months trying to so this is, I suppose we didn't solve it uh, completely yet. This is still work in the progress. Uh, 
No, of course, we first try to find some ready-made solution for or some research on doing this, but we, at least to the best of our knowledge, we didn't find anything that can structure and parse and understand and extract enough information from the proper names locally. There are some partial solutions for some languages, but there is no good solution for uh, multilingual uh, application and generally for historical text especially. Uh, okay, so just a sec. Uh, there are just a few examples how it's hard to parse and understand personal names. Uh, so, for example, in modern examples, this is examples uh, from uh, W Free Org that list the number of uh, problems that people are registering and logging into uh, web uh, systems, and websites. And uh, for example, if you it's visible, last of all, this is uh, Bjork. Does somebody know to pronounce last name properly? Islamic last name. Yok, good means to tear. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> this, this is the famous Bjork, you know, the singer. <laughs> it's Islamic name, and uh, in fact, there is no surname here. This is patronymic, uh, but if you address a per per uh, person in Iceland properly, it's uh, impolite to say, dear Mas Goodman's daughter. <laughs> if it is well, you have to use full name. Uh, it's similar with Arabic names uh, in Chinese and in many Slavic languages like Russian, Polish, uh, I believe also uh, Bulgarian, Serbian. Uh, it's custom to start the name of the person with the last name, not the first name. So this is something that uh, is often the case. As you know, uh, names in the Spain has this standard four token uh, <laughs> form. And it's something that the doesn't work well in web registration forms. And it's even worse, this is a case from Brazil. In Brazilian Spanish, they are just uh, naming ancestry. Uh, so it's even more complicated. Similar with Russian names and so on. So uh, this is even for the modern text, not an easy problem. Uh, for example, for historical cases, it's even worse. For example, this first uh, item, this expression God Tomislav, it means in creation King Tomislav. Uh, King is, of course, God here is title, it's not first name. Tomislav is first name, and if you apply this you know, brute force uh, method of taking first token and second token, it would be completely wrong, of course. Uh, there are many of these examples. Uh, with especially nobility, where names can consist of five to ten tokens or even more if you apply uh, if you apply this aggressive tokenization as we did. In fact, in our sources, average length of name expression is 3.5. So it's not two, what somebody would expect from the language where it usually have first name and last name, but because of all these titles and minor names and so on, uh, number of tokens is in fact too large to parse it properly. And uh, this illustration is uh, also an interesting illustration of what happens with the name through the history. This is the case of the name Leslie. Uh, and this name, uh, this is work from Blevis and Mullen. Uh, this uh, gender of the name Leslie changed through the history. So as you can see, until 1950s in the US, it used to be dominantly male name. And nowadays, it's female name. So this is another thing that you have to take into consideration when you are trying to extract information from the historical text. Okay? So, uh, after we uh, find this problem, we try to do, of course, is we are lazy people, the most simple solution to parse and understand uh, proper names. And this is something connected with what is called in natural language processing sequence labeling. So sequence labeling is, as you know, especially in text of text analysis, not biology, is part of pattern recognition. Models, in fact, you just want to label, to take every token in some sequence with some data. The most uh, 
widely used and most well-known kind of sequence labeling is part of speech language. You know, you need that the categories are uh, grammatical categories. Uh, unfortunately, for our purpose, uh, part of speech taggers, and there are many of good part, part of speech taggers, uh, doesn't enter into fine grain uh, distinction between kind of their name. They usually just have this N and B uh, tag, it means proper noun. But this is not enough for us. We want to know if this is personal name, is last name, title, and so on. So this is not ready of the shelf system that we could use. Similar case is with name entity recognition systems. Name entity recognition systems also just mark beginning and the end of the name expression, and we wanted to enter into structure of name. So this is also not a ready made solution, and very similar case is with shallow parsing. So, at least based on our knowledge, we, uh, there is no good ready made solution for our problem. And this is just an illustration of what we wanted to do from this system, what input will be name expression and output will be uh, tag. Name expression, we want to take this woman as a last name, we want to take Baronica, this means Baroness as a title, we want to take Josephine as a first name, and then we want to take the rest as a mighty name. In some cases, of course, we want even to enter into structure of this minor name and say this is title again, this is surname, and so on. But for our purposes, we, we thought this is enough for, for the beginning. So this is what we wanted to uh, have. And again, we tried to find easier, uh, easiest solution for this problem. And uh, easiest solution for this problem is nowadays called uh, conditional random fields. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, at least in my experience, uh, state of the art for these such sequence labeling uh, problems uh, was rule-based systems and sometimes hidden marker models. This is something that's a state of the art 20 years ago, but nowadays most of people doing any sequence labeling are using uh, conditional random fields. So I suppose you are familiar at least with the concept if you're not there, too little time <laughs> to go through this, but basic idea, uh, sure you are familiar with the logistic regression and just you can imagine uh, logistic regression is a linear uh, uh, fields, you can imagine that as a uh, abstraction of generalization of logistic regression. In logistic regression, uh, based on the features of the token, uh, you infer the most probable type. And in the conditional random fields based on the features of the token, but also the features of all other connected tokens, you make kind of joint inference and in fact uh, try to find the most probable list of the tags for this uh, for problem based on the features. Okay. Uh, so, as you know, this uh, types of reasoning uh, systems, of computational systems are uh, part of now dominant probabilistic graphical models. This is special type, kind of Markov network. And this is something that is now very widely used in many applications of uh, computing technology in many fields, including humanities. Uh, okay. So, what is the problem with uh, these uh, conditional random fields? Uh, as you know, uh, it's next to impossible to hand code this any probabilistic model. They are just too complex to just write them. Any reasonable way how you can uh, make conditional random fields that will take our name expression is to use supervised learning. And to use supervised learning, you have to label text, and this is first step that is often needed. So this. This is how we started, we just label our test set, our training set, with the categories we wanted to use. Uh, another step is learning. And learning is nowadays mostly used with black of box, uh, ready-made algorithms, but there are some, some uh, tuning, some, some piece you have to do, I will, I will come to this. And the final step in any machine learning process is evaluation. You just check how good your model is, 
And unfortunately, as very often your models are substandard, they are not performing so good, you conclude that you need more data and you just go around and around in circles. And it, this can be uh, quite time consuming. Okay, let me just. Uh, how much time? Oh, you, you're now about uh, 40 minutes. So ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so uh, in order to label text, uh, you first need to decide on the text set. You need what is this uh, labels that you want to apply to every token. And this is all, all many times uh, compromising between uh, a number of labels and accuracy of the model. Because uh, if you have only one label, of course, this is the extreme case, your model will be perfect. Be completely useful. If you increase the number of the labels, if you want to have fine grain tags of every possible uh, token, then probably the uh, quality of your model will go down, so you have to compromise some way. And this is the list of the tags we decide to apply to our test case. So this is first name in male and female form, this is last name, this is last name prefix, this is something you know that can be attached before. Uh, the before the last name, it's uh, often some nobility status or something like this. Then we have three, type, three types of titles. One is like standard personal title, and then there is qualification. This qualification was very uh, uh, it occurred quite frequently in our test set because uh, many people have the same names and surnames like their fathers or their fathers, so there are these junior, senior, and similar qualification. We also wanted to distinguish uh, salutation because they often have uh, interesting information like the gender of the person and so on. And we just, uh, last category is geographic item because in the census, for example, it's often after the name comes the, uh, either the place of the origin or the, or the place of the where this person lives. So this is something that was uh, frequent in, in, our, in our set, and we wanted to put all the other token in this other category. Okay, so uh, next step after deciding uh, of this text set is doing this manual tagging of uh, labeling of tagging set. And uh, generally speaking, uh, main advantage of applying uh, supervised learning is that this tagging can be done by the person who just uh, understands the language or basics of the problem. It doesn't have to be expert. This is, this is good. Things that this is usually done by the students. At least graduate students also. finish <laughs> their PhD. So it's, it's not so hard to get these text labels. But the problem is label of this text is error prone, especially in the case of historical text. You, you, you really need to know something about uh, this time of history, this period of history, about context, uh, to resolve ambiguity that occurs in the text. So, uh, for our test case, uh, we extracted uh, altogether uh, 6,500 items. Uh, item, by item, I mean this name expression, like full name, and we did it on the modern text. So we trained our system of the modern text because we didn't have available historical text that they are Okay, uh, so uh, next step after having enough uh, label data, and usually it's never enough, but as much as you can uh, collect, uh, one applies standard learning techniques to build computational model, in our case this is conditional random field. As it's very rare the case that a uh, machine learning engineer write their own algorithm, you usually uh, use uh, ready-made algorithms. Uh, but before using algorithms, you have one important step. This step is defining features of the, all the tokens in our data set. So this, this is an important uh, step because uh, as many features as possible often increase the quality. So this is some standard case, and for, for our uh, purposes we just use the uh, normalized token. We use type uh, of the token based on our machine dictionary, 
and then use context and some other feature like is it uppercase, is it title case, and so on from the model. So we play a bit with this, and this because this is quite important step that can influence the quality of the model. Uh, and after this, after you define these uh, features, uh, you just apply the algorithm. Uh, there are in many machine learning algorithms. Uh, many hyperparameters to be tuned. And this is something that is standardly done by so-called grid search, so you just do brute for, force on your uh, so-called uh, cross-validation uh, subset of your training set, where you find the best hyperparameter that give the best results for the rest of the training set. Okay, final step is uh, rather trivial one, this, this uh, evaluation, so uh, just what is a bit uh, non-standard in our case is that you can evaluate uh, the two, le two levels. One is token level, this, is, this will be standard, another is item level, so is the whole name parsed well or not. So, uh, and of course, uh, this uh, token level always uh, performs better than item level, but generally you are interested in fact on item level, you just want to have names parsed well, so you want to calculate how many names are uh, recognized well by your computational model. Okay, so to summarize some drawbacks and advantages of uh, this approach, uh, at least this approach uh, for historical data, uh, first advantage is that uh, conditional level fields are widely used and there are many available implementation and it's really easy to implement. Uh, second, they definitely outperform other, at least other probabilistic models like hidden Markov models and so on. And uh, I already mentioned this third advantage. Uh, you don't need computer scientists or programmer to build rules for this. You just need person understanding language who labels your data and you use machine learning to develop algorithms. So this is definitely a big advantage. Uh, but uh, what is the biggest drawback in this first two are connected is that uh, conditional random fields have to be retrained on every different type of the source. And this can be very frustrating because you train the model on one data set and you then got some similar but different uh, data set. For example, typical difference what, uh, what we experience is that in, in some serial sources uh, name expression started with first name, in other it started with last name. So this is some, something obvious to the person, but it's not obvious to the conditional error first model. They just didn't perform that. So in fact, you have to label additional data for each uh, new source if it is structurally different. This is quite frustrating. Uh, connected with, do, with this, there is no ad hoc uh, way to uh, make this twist in the model and say, okay, now uh, there should be first first name, then second last name, because the conditional random fields are so complicated, they are in a structure that it's next to impossible to twist them, to change them manually. So you just have to retain them. Uh, and uh, the last observation will be more philosophical, but uh, it can also be frustrating. Uh, there is something in philosophy that is called semantically op opaque. This is something that uh, can't be really easy understandable by human. And if you ask why question, why this name is stuck with the wrong, with the wrong type tag, you just can't get the answer from the probabilistic graphical models. You, it's just this joint distribution, distribution of probability is too complex that you can find real answer to the y question. Unlike in the rule-based models where you can say, okay, this rule was applied, so this is the mistake. So this is, uh, in my opinion, a big drawback uh, in applying this standard uh, sequence labeling approach to the historical text. Okay, uh, another alternative, or sometimes uh, complementary uh, approach to sequence labeling is rule-based. And probably many of you have heard for this real tagger. This is one of the first uh, part of speech uh, tagger that use uh, rules of this form. 
So it's very simple uh, part of speech tagger. In the first phase, it just uh, assigns the most probable uh, type from the dictionary. And in the second phase, it uses rules like those to improve the quality of the label text. So this is just rules that say change this tag to this if this condition is met. So change, uh, I believe this is a uh, verb in past time. Is there some expert in post here? This, this should be a really word in past part. Well, this is word in past tense. So change this if previous words capitalized. This, this is kind of uh, rules that uh, is very simple. And this is in fact the first system that we tried to use uh, in solving our problem. The problem with this system is that uh, complexity and interaction of the rules uh, very soon become intractable. In fact, it, it's very hard for a human to understand uh, which rule change other rules and you just correct one mistake and a few new mistakes uh, uh, pop up. So this is, this is something that wasn't applicable to our test case. Uh, another interesting rule-based system, and this is done by this Pedro Dominguez, we mentioned in joint inference, uh, is so-called marked logic networks. This, this is very interesting uh, approach that combines probabilistic graphical models together with first-order logic. You, so you have full expressive power of first-order logic, but you can uh, handle unknown information, monotonicity, and such things. Uh, the problem with this concrete uh, system is it just didn't scale well for our case. It's, we gave up after two weeks of waiting <laughs> for the learning algorithms to finish, so the, this, is the, this is the problem with this particular case. So, what, uh, okay, just, just to make a short summary about this rule based approach. So, it seems almost the opposite to the probabilistic models. Uh, advantage is that you can easily and quickly uh, encode regularity in the tutorial text to the system and uh, you, you just can very quickly hand coded few rules like regular expression and anything else and solve much of the problem. So this is definitely an advantage and in my opinion biggest advantage is that you can understand and read this rule. So this is something you, you can you can see where uh, mistakes come from, where there is error, unlike the probabilistic model. Uh, the problem is that it's very hard to do and you need a trained person that is trained both in this rule-based system and is in a topic of publication. So it's hard to find people who can uh, write good rules for this sequence level of problem. And again, a uh, big problem is this complex interaction of the rules because there are many rules and there is, as you know, in human language and anything that has to do with human reasoning, there are so many exceptions, so many complex interactions, so it's quite hard to uh, handle this interaction. Okay, so finally, uh, this is the uh, rule system that we tried to implement. This is what we decided to use. Uh, so just, how much time is it? Well, we have 10 uh, after 5, so, so ten minutes. if you could, yeah, like, okay, okay, uh, yeah, so okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so, so just quickly, uh, this is a system that's called answer set programming. This is uh, some kind, of, it will be said that it's a new type of logic, logic programming, I suppose many of you are familiar with, but there is uh, some improvements that are made in this system. For example, if you recognize these rules, for example, from the Pro and some other uh, programming language, uh, this could be a loop. This, this will never finish. And in answer set programming in the state of model semantics, you will just get two answers. So this is something that is very useful uh, and it demonstrated to be used in our case. Another important feature of this system is that you have two kinds of negation. Uh, you have strong negation and you have this default negation. So this first you say field if there is no shark, sharks, means try to prove sharks, if you can't prove, okay, you can see. 
And the second negation, strong negation, which is more like classical negation in logic, uh, you can swim only if you can prove that there are no sharks. And these two negations are extremely useful, as you will see soon, for uh, modeling non ontonic reasoning and to make uh, possible that you make inferences from more general from general to more specific. Uh, okay, so we'll skip this. Uh, okay, bef before uh, first step in building our model was uh, development of large machine dictionary uh, of proper names of personal names. So we managed to collect altogether 36, uh, almost 37 millions of records of different names, and this is dictionary we used in both in conditional random fields and in our rule-based approach. Uh, okay, so this is how looks rules in our system. So uh, basically, it's very simple. Uh, you have tag in some record at some position. So output of our system is that you just take some token in some record uh, with some weight, so some kind of confidence level. But what is new in our approach is that you also have a level. So you, in fact, uh, you make, you write or learn the rules in various levels. Uh, first level is most general, and then you go to more and more specific. And this, uh, this is enabled by this kind of negation. It means use this rule if there is no more specific rules for the same token. It's quite simple and it's very easy to implement this into this answer set programming. So generally this uh, rule will say, okay, put tag title. If there is lexical entry, that this could be title. And if token form is in fact uh, lowercase letters, and previous token is start is capitalized is sentence case, and there are uh, possibility that previous and next token previous token is first name and next token is last name. So uh, it's make it looks uh, strange at the first time, but it's quite very very simple, very very similar, very very uh, easy to write uh, rules. Uh, okay. So, uh, we first hand coded very few, about five, six of such rules, and then we developed learning algorithms uh, to uh, learn, learn additional rules of this format. And uh, I suppose we don't have time to go through the learning algorithms, but the main idea is to have this uh, layered reasoning where we first learn the most general rules and then go to more and more specific rules. Uh, okay, so can, when we apply uh, these uh, learned rules, uh, it's important to emphasize that uh, rules are also learned in the modern language. So as in the case of conditional random fields, we learn rules on the modern language, not on the historical language. And uh, we got pretty good results. So this is in, uh, when, we, when we compare statistical and rule-based approach, uh, this is result of conditional random fields that is trained on the modern uh, data and this is result of the rule-based approach that's also trained on modern data. So even initial uh, model performed better in the case of rule-based model. Uh, then we try to some way say, okay, maybe there's not enough to compare, let's improve both models. And this is a bit tricky, but we generally say, okay, let's uh, invest uh, similar resources into improvement of both models. So for the conditional random fields, uh, we just uh, take uh, hundred additional uh, hundred additional items from historical text, and for rule-based system, we just uh, write three additional rules and add it as the most specific rules in our system. And as you can see, uh, system this rule base performed pretty well on this our test case of historical test. Of course, this is not a very 
uh, general result because this is only one test case, it has to be applied to many other historical cases. But generally, uh, our opinion is that for this specific historical text, uh, rule based systems perform better and they are easier to use. Okay, we also did. Uh, classification, standard classifiers for detection of gender and detection of stability. This is something that is done very, very standard, so we just apply uh, infinity gram uh, features uh, and then this of the small subset of our data and this classifier performed quite well, at least on these historical sources. Okay, uh, so to try to conclude, uh, as already said, I believe that rule-based approach, especially this uh, rule-based approach based on default model semantic, uh, is more suitable for tagging, parsing names in historical text. And definitely we have to do more tests and more cases to confirm this. And another line of approach we want to develop is to find a way to combine uh, probabilistic approach and rule-based approach. Uh, and we believe, we believe that best results will be achieved by the proper model assembly of these two approaches. Uh, and definitely what is long-term goal is to use these systems and similar systems in developing joint inference model that will be able to convert historical sources to the semantical web. Okay. Uh, okay, then we just... It's past right. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I'm on uh, so, uh, this is the application of the same problem uh, to the modern text. So, we uh, build... Uh, in fact, this will be uh, our university uh, startup for parsing uh, new pro pro proper names. The <laughs> idea is to parse it properly. Uh, it's okay. of this modern system is uh, use of uh, now it's called big data to build uh, classification of languages uh, based on the similarity of uh, proper names between the countries. So what we build, we build a big database of 160 million per persons and 30 million organizations and 1.5 million uh, location and we mesh so-called Jacquard similarity, familiar with Jacquard similarity, is one kind of similarity between overlapping offsets uh, to make automatic uh, factorization of countries based on the similarity of their uh, first names. This is still work in progress and uh, we can be, some of you are linguists willing to help us in this, I'm a philosopher, <laughs> so I don't, don't know much about languages. Uh, and uh, another maybe interesting uh, application of this same algorithm is uh, we did classification of all authors in the Amazon database. So we did just simple gender classification of uh, authors in uh, uh, all the books in Amazon. And when you uh, find the biggest difference between gender of author, all authors, in the books, I, I suppose you can't read it, but the, on the top there is programming, and there is you know 1.7 million of pro, programming books uh, that are written by males, and only 2,400 programming books that are written by females. Uh, the opposite is case with Dr. Dr. Seuss. I suppose this is <laughs> not so good example, but another maybe good example is. What is the big romance? For example, romance fan fiction is written by only 9,000 9, males and then 293,000 people. <laughs> this is another work in progress that uh, can be uh, easier achieved using our classifiers. Okay, 
I uh, hope I didn't uh, uh, this in time. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, uh, I know some of us are really interested in this topic, uh, working on this, uh, and uh, I invite you now to ask questions, uh, comments, and yeah. I have a question about um, the data that you used. So, uh, the, is, is the um, sort of the data the same, like for the same set as the evaluation data? No, we take the model on the model data. We just made we make a simple from the about fifteen sources mainly just author database with the data and so we uh, modern text is labeled uh, no 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 the historical text. So uh, you didn't annotate you did you annotate it yourself yourself? Uh, that is done by students, but yeah, the authors. Okay. And why didn't you annotate uh, historical? Uh, we, we did just for experiment one of the this additional content for improving CRF. We just don't have enough historical data to annotate. We, we have this small data set we use for testing purposes. Of course, it would be more more help, helpful to have more data. But uh, what, what I believe we can say that once there is huge variety in these sources. So if you look census data or parish books data, they will all, all have some structural dissimilarities. And this is why I believe that uh, it's easier to be, you know, immediately seen by a human researcher and with one rule solved, instead of, you know, spend a few days of annotating enough data, building model, and then this model will be not useful for another uh, data set. So, <laughs> Uh, my more general question, I was just interested in uh, why you started this project. It seems very strange in a way from a philosophy department to be um, stepping into this realm which you know, smells terribly of computer science. <laughs> well, uh, I agree with computer science and I started uh, in NLP 20 something years ago. Then I forgot about this for the last 20 years and then I was talking with Professor Witted, we were roommates <laughs> during the student's day to do something that will connect logic and history. And we wanted to do this, you know, smart advanced things like, okay, let's do some smart reasoning and so on. And we just find we can't do this. <laughs> we have no data to do this. So this was like, we imagined that we would be easy problem to solve quickly and proceed to this, you know, advanced <laughs> smart things, but we start here. <laughs> so we are still trying to do this properly and then the next step would be this relation extraction and so on so to, to have at least at least measured by number of people uh, 50,000 or something of people in some semantic web to try to do this logical reasoning about historical data. And may I also ask how big your team is? Um, how many people are working or how many students? Well, very few students <laughs> help and then we managed to pursue them is good for some kind of graduation <laughs> program or something, but generally it's, it's darker than me and we have four or five students that helps from time to time. So we are open to all kind of cooperation, of course. <laughs> this is something we would like to do. And you're, you're saying you're working only with the census, the, the Croatian census? No, this is sort of the, 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 the test case. It, okay. it, it should, generally, we would like to build it for all languages. Our, our database of uh, names are global for uh, all languages. This, this is in German, this census data, <laughs> not some modern ones that are in Croatian, other in Latin. So I, it, we would like to build a global system that would be applicable to any type of data. That's great. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> I have another question about uh, the joint inference model. Yeah, um, the joint inference model. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask why it's not uh, more used. I, I mean, uh, because it, it, it's, it's uh, very computationally complex. There, there is some, some simple uh, kind of joint inference models, so-called beam search. Beam search is a kind of the this. Just to return to the uh, pipeline. I usually do not 
do PowerPoint presentation, so I'm not uh, okay. So, uh, what, what would uh, BIM search do? It would produce five uh, most probable solutions for this, then five for this, then five for this, and for example, five is called MB usually. And then you have uh, about, this will take it, there are five, five step, steps, uh, so it will be five times five uh, number of uh, possible solutions. And you will then just then join probability and find the most probable one in, for all these segments. This, this, this is what is sometimes done, but still it's much more complex to do than uh, this just forgot take the best solution from here, then proceed on, you know. And the problem is and each of these steps has some errors, and these errors just accumulate in the process. So you not, uh, finally get 50% <laughs> accuracy on generation extraction, and in your difference it could be much much better, but it will take more resources, more time. Yeah, another, another, another issue is that you need a good system to do joint inference. So a simple, simple question fields are not enough. This is something like this. Marco logic networks designed to do this, but they don't perform well. So I believe this is future, but with more resources and maybe better, <laughs> better systems. Can, can it work with uh, supervised Data. Yes, of course, of course. It's just uh, having all possible solution of every model and finding the most, most probable one. But the problem is, as, as always, there is you know huge uh, explosion of complexity on every level, so it can be untractable. But you know, to to just take too much time to <laughs> compute this joint inference. Because every of these steps is very optimized, as you know. You know it verifies, it, 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 it's good, but if you just consider top five, you number of time you know, what is five over five? So I'm not good in the <laughs> Okay, so five over five, over five <laughs> number of uh, solutions that you have to check. This is it's a lot. A lot. There's many digits. setting of your, your work um, and uh, actually you, you, in the very beginning you said well the historians use the wrong tools they use Excel uh, this, this and is this is my experience yes yes, yes. Uh, uh, I just, uh, uh, and uh, this is interesting uh, now how uh, how you collaborate with historians so you work of course with uh, Professor uh, Vitek together are there? I just I'm just curious. Are there others uh, joining this group, or, or uh, how is the uh, collaboration between uh, logic, philosophical logic, applied logic, and historians uh, on the other side? Because there are probably much more historians around in Zagreb and in other, uh, in other cities. So is there? Uh, is it just uh, like you and your colleague, or or do you try to uh, convince other historians uh, <laughs> yeah. of advantages and uh, want to uh, also uh, maybe uh, uh, open the, the system uh, for other colleagues uh, that they can use it? And, uh, it is regarding the last, last, last question, definitely we would like to put it open source in, in, in some phase. This is uh, and about this uh, collaboration with historians, we, we tried few collaboration. Problem is you now that people are used to doing last one day. For example, we wanted to there is one colleague of us who transcribed took him I believe 15 years or something tax census of the Salon. It's huge, beautiful resource, but it's written you know in Excel in the same same field, <laughs> same line. Okay. So uh, and we tried to convince him, okay. When you continue transcribing, uh, just at least segment this into same segments as you can see you know, on this source. But it wasn't very successful <laughs> because you know, when people are just used to do things in one way, it's hard to change them. Okay. But, but definitely. But hopefully, we'll build system that will enable even to you know process such sources. It's definitely much easier to use at least such unstructured text 
but at least it's at least some kind of normal text, then to try to <laughs> automatically get it from the images of the slides. So this is <laughs> um, I have a question to the slide as well, and I'm interested in these um, dirty text normalization. So, um, up to which degree of noise uh, the algorithms on the third, uh, second, third, and fourth level uh, still work, or when is the level where the noise is simply too big, where you say, okay, throw it away? Um, this, is a, this is the first question, and the second part of it, it is um, very much a kind of part of a cluster. Um, how do you say, for example, for OCR or for handwriting recognition, how do you say this is an OCR error? And this is, for example, um, a spelling error or whatever. So other different kinds of variants of the normal correct form, especially when you're working on historical text as distinction uh, is of interest. Yeah. Well, the, regarding the first question, I'm not sure I can answer the second question. <laughs> but regarding the first question, uh, what we try to do is to do uh, this text organization not on this source, but of another source, this is a 19th century uh, printed book of inhabitants of Croatia. There is one, one like the directory of Croatia, so we did OCR there, and the result was because it's old font and so on, it's better than handwritten, uh, handwritten text, but it's still uh, dirty text. The, one of the biggest problems was in this text phase, uh, if I remember well, uh, less than half of the tokens were recognized in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem was this uh, space at the end of the lines and such things that have to be normalized and we did some ad hoc normalization trying to you know, connect two tokens and if they are not in the dictionary separately but if they exist in the dictionary together we join them but the results were not great because improved text but it's still generated a big problem in all these other segments. For example, because uh, the both uh, conditional random fields and our algorithm uh, presuppose that at least one uh, token is valid in the dictionary. You know, if you have a surname that you can conclude that previous value is first name. But uh, in, in, in this case, the text was uh, dirty, the operation was quite low. I don't have still exact results, but first impression is that this, this is hard stage and it will be great to have this solved because it, it, it will help. But again, I'm afraid this is at least performed by human kind of joint inference, you know, because you, you look at the text, they say, okay, this starts here, and this starts next line, so this is the same same token. And then, then performed by machine, it generates just too much noise. And regarding the, uh, this uh, and written recognition that I don't take but here. I just play a bit with building some neural networks, uh, training them for uh, for this task, but it didn't perform well. <laughs> so uh, I just it's kind of answer this totally. I've got a question. Uh, you uh, you said uh, you don't have training sets um, for historical names. Um, uh, do you know this? Um, Dictionary of medieval names from European sources. Uh, yeah, I saw them, yeah. What, what but, but it's just it's dictionary, it's not label text, if I remember well. Yeah. It's like dictionary, you have the, 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 this subject we, we try to include in this hour. Okay. Uh, this. We try to include all these sources you found from the. the it's, it's very useful but, because. But now it's a, an online resource and I, I'm not too sure, but it should be but relatively. A, it's a, it's a big database of medieval names and it should be structured data, uh, I think. It's useful for dictionary. Yeah. But we, we need, you know, full name expression with every token labeled in one of these. I'm not sure. At least maybe it will get yeah. something with yeah. this exists, but medieval names just have. Yes, name, name, names, and yeah, 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 yeah. And we, we try to collect all these sources because, you know, yeah. many names are extinct. But it, it, it's useful part in, in this, you know, machine dictionary inferring the most popular time. But you need the uh, structure, you need what word is before, what is next, to learn properly algorithms. You know, you just need sequences that are labeled. But like you know, fake database for modern text, uh, there, there are many such databases for modern text, with part of speech, uh, but, uh, but for historical text, 
didn't have to find anything in any language. <laughs> but may, maybe there are some somewhere, some source that I, I wasn't able to find. Uh, I didn't answer your question properly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and then we, we did just like. Uh, uh, sorry. So, what we need is. We need uh, something like this. Mm -hmm. you know, because then learning algorithms can learn the probability of title being before first name or something like this. And if you have only dictionary, this is not enough for learning algorithms to learn enough of structure in firmware. It will definitely be helpful. Every new source is helpful, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is generally problem in you know, all supervised machine learning. You know, you need, just need big data to learn them any model. And it's, it is relatively easy to do this. You can outsource this to Amazon third or somebody who do this for you. You can have the resources, but there is not enough data and you always need more and more data and there are not so many data that publicly available that you just can download and use for such models. Still, I do you think you can really uh, run a, a general approach to this problem? Because, as you say, there are so many different rules that are applicable, possible, uh, depending on the on the text. So then I mean, you might find even in the source text. Uh, if find my, you might, might, may find very different rules for all the different centuries uh, you're running through and all the different regions as well. Mm -hmm. As you said, as you pointed out, there are different customs uh, of, in, the part, in every part of the world and uh, of course also over time things, uh, things change and uh, also in the context of every document uh, uh, there can be a particular rule uh, uh, applicable or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Do you really want to run this as a kind of general approach to all kinds of documents or would you rather uh, try to uh, optimize uh, uh, your approach for particular classes of documents or particular uh, centuries or... Uh, this is our question. <laughs> this is a question about what we, what we try to do just to show you maybe if I manage to exit from this. Uh, so we try to do this uh, for the modern test. This is now. <laughs> so this is this our project for the modern text. And what, what was our, our idea is to be started with historical text. Then we switch to the modern uh, text and try to do so this as many languages as possible uh, to do it properly. And our idea is to then have this general model that will work for everything, and then just uh, adjust this model for particular source. Okay. So ideally, you, you have good model that will work for most of the documents, and then it will come to some kind of same source types data. Just you know, write a few rules. Uh, it would be excellent to even build some, you know, graphical interface for the rule, so that anybody can, you know, uh, in graphical easy way, encode this regularity, like last name, first name, <laughs> or some kind of variants, and, and then solve these particular problems. This is why we believe that this rule-based approach is better, because you just, uh, especially in this uh, uh, non-monotonic, default semantic uh, model, you just, okay, this is general rules, but specific rules for this source are this free. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully it will be better on the end of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, this is a very, very good project. It's online, you can check it, of course. I would appreciate any, any comments, but <laughs> it's still not, you know, it works for your name, but <laughs> not, not for all. It's something that uh, we all try our names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions? No? Comments? 
If not, I, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, this very interesting talk. Uh, thank you. Discussion. Thank you. To all of us, thank you for the discussion.